Good afternoon, everyone. Can you can you listen to me? Can you hear me? And uh, can you all see the screen? Wonderful. Well, as I was telling you, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for participating in this new webinar. This originated with uh, the initiative of uh, LACNIC. And here we're going to discuss uh, intra and uh, inter RIR IPv4 transfers. We have two speakers, Alfredo Verderosa, who's a LACNIC service manager, and Sergio Rojas, also of LACNIC. Let me tell you, before we start, that we estimate that this webinar will take about 60 minutes. You'll have a chance to ask questions throughout the presentation of the speakers. While the presentation is being given, you can leave your questions in pressing the button uh, Q&A, preguntas y respuestas that you have uh, at the bottom of the screen. And uh, once the presentations are over, we are going to ask uh, those questions to each of the speakers. The webinar also as, uh, was, uh, uh, is being recorded. And these uh, one of, and uh, soon you're going to have a link where it will be available. Now I won't uh, share my screen anymore and I invite Alfredo. Alfredo, welcome. You have the floor. Are you ready? Thank you, Mariela. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share the presentation. Mariela, could you please tell me if I'm heard well? Yes. Everything's perfect. Go ahead. Thank you. Before I start, I'm going to stop for a minute in the contents of the presentation so that you may all know what we are going to discuss. In the first part, I'm going to tell you a bit about the context and the policy enabling intra and inter RIR transfers. Then we're going to see some uh, intra RIR statistics transfers within the region. Of, uh, then we're going to talk about the implementation of uh, inter RIR transfers that are being enabled since uh, the 20th this month and then inter RIR statistics in other regions in closing this first part. Then I'm going to give the floor to Sergio, who's going to tell you about the process of uh, inter and inter RIR transfer requests and the list of uh, the uh, possible transfers. It's been on for some time, but we're going to uh, review it and then we're going to leave some space for questions. Well, now let's start. Given the ratification of uh, the um, uh, LAC 2019 one uh, uh, proposal, it's possible to uh, do transfers both within and outside the region without a need for um, uh, uh, by purchase or merging process among the companies involved. There are some things that you have to consider. The organization receiving an IPv4 block may transfer it only after three years after having received it, either fully or partially. It's also important to note that a block that was transferred cannot be transferred again for one year. And finally, that uh, the legacy resources that are transferred will not be considered uh, as legacy resources. Uh, there you have a link with the text of the policy. There you can see more information and uh, you may ask your, you may send queries. Now, I, we were talking about the number of transactions. There's been a steady increase of transfers since 2016 when we first implemented it. There were only five that year. Then in 2018 and 2019, there was quite a significant increase up to uh, 63 in 2019, up to, um, but these are very low numbers if you consider other regions. And this is something that we consider later on. 
So here you have another graph with the number of uh, the transfers and the net balance of transfers per country. How can we interpret this chart? Well, on the one hand, we have in one end, we have Colombia, where the net balance of the transfers uh, uh, yields uh, plus 45,000. That is, they have a positive uh, uh, balance of 45,000. On the other end, we have Panama with a negative balance of 95,000. So the idea of this chart is to show you the uh, uh, transfers uh, among the countries that has taken place uh, since uh, the intra-RAR uh, uh, transfers were enabled. So here we'll show you the uh, location of the organizations involved here, uh, either selling or buying resources. Brazil leads with 61, then Argentina with 29, Panama with 14, and then we have Ecuador, Colombia, and Chile with uh, um, uh, 12, 11, and 9. So closing the statistics into RIR, I wanted to share the number of uh, in other RIRs. And this is why I was telling you that we have very low figures in Norwegian, because look at the uh, pale orange. In 2019, in APNIC, there were more than 500 transactions within uh, their RIR. Um, Arin, uh, almost 1,000, and uh, RIPE, almost 2,000. So you see that we are very far from their numbers. Now, the second topic that I wanted to tell you about is the inter-RIR implementation. Nine versions of four proposals for uh, inter-RIR uh, transfer policies were presented, and finally it was ratified in LAC 2019, one in June last year. It was a very complex uh, uh, issue. There were more than 25 people involved, uh, including the RIRs, the two NIRs, Brazil and Mexico, and ourselves. And where we talk, we worked all this time to uh, design and uh, uh, adequate the processes for the transfers. And we also worked trying to adapt the systems because there were 11 systems uh, in uh, uh, that were being used by LACNIC in the two NIRs. As we don't have a history in our region of transfers, I took a couple of slides from a publication that is posted in the NRO website, where you can see the inter-RAR transfers. Uh, to show you what's happening around the world. And here you see that the main source of transfers is Aaron, with almost 600 uh, outgoing transfers. Those are the arrows in red. And you may wonder why. Why is it that Aaron is uh, uh, sending so many transfers? Because Aaron had a very significant number of legacy resources. And these legacy resources are the main source of transfers, uh, inter-RIR transfers. Before giving the floor to Sergio, I'd like to, sh uh, to share the same slide with the number of IPs transferred. Here you can see that there were more than 33 million IPs in recent years and almost 28 million, 27 million were outbound from Aaron to the others, around 80%. So far, this is what I wanted to uh, tell you. And now I'll give the floor to Sergio. Thank you. Me confirman, por favor, que ven correctamente la Vemos la correctamente. Sí, vemos y te escuchamos correctamente. Perfecto. Muchas gracias, Mariela. Thank you, Mariela. 
So having seen the statistics and the reports that Alfredo shared with you and knowing more about the implementation of the intra and inter RIRs since they began to be implemented, let me now share with you a couple of slides or rather a step-by-step -step guideline as to how to initiate an IPv4 transfer at LACNIC and also outside the LACNIC region. We decided that it would be better to prepare a step-by-step -step guideline and not slide-by-slide. -slide. So let me tell you that the request for transfer is done through the Mi LACNIC portal. With the same, it is necessary to access this link, lacnic.net, and the user regarding the administrative point of contact of the offering organization can initiate this process. If we use a different user ID, such as the point of contact for billing or membership, then the menu will not be available at the MILACNIC portal. So I have to bear that in mind to have the administrative user of the organization for which you wish to carry out this transfer. As I was saying, let me now change screens and show you the step-by-step -step guideline. We have a testing platform with a testing organization where I will be sharing this with you. So here we access the milacnic.lacnic.net platform. I'm going to use this user, which is a testing, the user for testing purposes, and we will start the session. Once you have gone through the authentication, those of you who are familiar with the platform and also for those who are not familiar with it, on the left, you see the organizations to which I, as an RSA user, am the administrative point of contact. We're now going to do the test with this organization, the identifier UIY OPPL LACNIC, and we'll click on the Recursos IP slash ASN, IP ASN resources, and we see three buttons. We're going to select transfer and return. Here, we scroll down to the option transfer resources to another organization in this section. You'll see to which organization these will be transferred and whether the receiving organization is in our region or outside our region. Let us now focus on the inter-RIR transfers, that is to say outside the region. And let us click on this button when we see, when we see transfer to our an organization outside the region. We fill in this form, and this is a step-by-step -step assistant. The first screen requests information regarding the offering organization. We now know that this will be a request for transfer from this organization called owner for testing purposes of LACNIC. The form will ask for the legal representative's name of that organization. This is because if this is approved, this person will have to sign a document or several documents where the legal representative of the offering organization signs this. So the name of the person included here has to have the real legal representation for that organization. So let us do a test. Juan Gomez as a legal representative. Then we have to see which is the IPv4 block in case. By default, this is the one that is included, which is a slash 22. Bear in mind that the policies allow you to do full or partial transfer. So if you don't wish to transfer the entire slash 22 block, we can put a slash 23 or slash 24. But let us assume that it is a complete transfer. So let's leave slash 22. We click on add. And once this has been done, we're going to request to attach some document that shows the legal representation of Juan Gomez. It could be a letter um, um, of attorney, uh, 
um, a power of attorney, sorry, and then a PDF file or JPG or compressed types of files. And once we upload it, we click on the next button. The next screen is going to ask us for to provide information on the receiving organization. In other words, to the organization with where we are transferring the IPv4 block first, we have to know what country or what region this belongs to. Let us select an RIR here. We know Can I continue? I think I heard Pablo's voice. Mariela, can you confirm whether you are hearing me? Yes, you can continue. I apologize for the inter interruption. So what we do here then is, as Alfredo mentioned in his presentation, the RIRs that allow inter-RIRs uh, transfers are APNIC, ARIN, and RIPE NCC. We have to select the receiving organization, what region the receiving organization belongs to. For example, APNIC. The next field, all the ones that have an asterisk are mandatory fields. The next is some kind of ID of the receiving organization for example, the identifier. And because we have reached an agreement with a receiving organization, that organization can give us the ID or the ASN that APNIC has assigned them or which is the IPv4 block that APNIC has assigned. So once we have included one of these data, we complete that field. Let us, for example, include the ASN. 2,800. I don't know if this this belongs to APNIC or Arene or which. Then we have to enter the name of the organization. For example, Fast Internet. The contact name of Fast Internet. For example, John Hogan. The email of the contact person, John at fastinternet.com.au. That's just an example. And then the telephone number, John's telephone number. So he's in Australia, obviously. So we have to select the country. And that is the country code. And this is his telephone number, 123456. The postal address of that organization Merrill Street, 4545, and then the country where this is established. And of course, this is Australia. We know it is located in Australia. The city is also a mandatory field, Melbourne, and other fields which are not mandatory. But if we do have that information, we can also include it and the postal code. We click on Next. And this is the last screen. This is not mandatory, but the form can allow the applicant to include other type of information that might be considered relevant and that they might wish to share with us. Bear in mind that the clearer the information provided, the faster the approval of this request will be. I mention this because once you receive this request, an analyst from LACNIC will contact you for the purpose of conducting the analysis. This form also allows you to attach some additional type of form that you wish to share with LACNIC. We're not going to select any for this case, and then we click on finish. But if you do have any information that you wish to add, it would be ideal to do so. And then we receive a message stating that the request has been correctly processed and in the next few days, someone will be contacting you by email. This contact will be done through the email address of the user that submitted this request. In my case, this was SRA. So this is the associated 
email address which will be used for this purpose but there are some cases where the users have an email address which belongs to the area or to the equipment which can be knock or data center at mycompany.com so let us always check this because within 48 to 72 hours they will be contacting you through this email address so please be sure that you check the address that you included in the application so that is for the purpose of completing the inter rir request now let us look at the re inter rir process the intra rir process within the same rir so this is quite similar and let me show you very rapidly so once again we select we click on resources ip slash asn and we follow the same steps that i showed you earlier on so here we select transfer resources to another organization and then within the same region so this is a very similar form we include the name of the legal representative add juan gomez And here, they're not going to ask us which RIR this belongs to, because of course, this is within the same RIR. So we do have, but we do have to complete the information of the organization. So as you see, this is very similar to the previous one, except that you don't have to include the RIR. And then of course, the next step is any additional information that you would like to include then you click on finish and your request will be processed following which one of our analysts will be contacting you and then the step-by-step -step process to complete the form So, once the request for the transfer has been received, we have to request the person who submitted, we have to submit, check, we're going to verify the received information, we're going to check the legal representative, we're going to check whether this company is still valid and to check further the reasons why they wish to have this transfer. There are no limitations if this is part of the policy Alfredo mentioned, which are the requirements for requesting transfers. At least three years have to have elapsed since having received the IPv4 block that we wish to transfer. So we conduct several checks to determine whether additional documentation has to be requested or whether we suspect that the applicant is no longer part of that organization. So we need to have some kind of background information of companies providing services in that country to check the veracity of the information provided by the applicant. So if this request is approved, a transfer agreement has to be signed. That is why it is important to include the data of the legal representative of your respective organizations. Now, what are the administrative fees? How much does it cost to transfer an IPv4 block? Before starting the analysis of this application, we're going to issue an invoice for $200 prior to conducting the analysis. And we should mention here that if this is not approved, these $200 are not reimbursed. Once we receive the $200, we conduct the analysis, we request for the information and additional data on the organization. And if they comply with all the requirements established in the policies, we issue a pre-approval. This is because the IPv4 block will be for another organization. So the rece receiver will have to justify this. Our analysts are going to ask the receiving organization 
which are these resources, how are they going to be distributed, they have to justify why they wish to receive this space. That is regarding a transfer in our region. If it is a transfer outside the region, and following the same example, once the application form is completed, we'll contact APNIC and tell them, well, there is an organization in our region that wishes to transfer an IPv4 block to an organization in Australia, which is called Fastnet Internet. So APNIC will contact Fastnet in Australia and ask them for the justification. In other words, they have to comply with all the requirements established in the policy to, be see, to become a receiving organization. And if that receiving organization complies with all these requirements, APNIC will inform us that this application has been approved. And then we go on to the following step. As I said, the initial cost is $200, but this all depends on the amount of IPv4 space that we wish to transfer. With that aim, we have two ranges for any IPv4 block between a slash 24 or less than slash 2019, the transfer cost is $1,000. But we already received an initial payment of $200, so you only have to pay $800. For any transfer uh, as from slash 19 onwards, the cost of the administrative fee is $1,500. And as we said already, the initial $200 already paid will be discounted. In other words, this will be $1,500. With uh, a transfer agreement that must be signed by the appropriate organization, in this case, if it's in inter RIR, then the organization that offers it will uh, sign it, and if it's outside the region, then both have to sign the transfer agreement. Having met all these requirements, we coordinate with the RIR, and we say, ladies and gentlemen, our organization is ready for this transfer, and we coordinate the time to, for the transfer, and we let the organizations know that a transfer has been successfully Basically, that's what we do. There are going to be more controls from our side, both from our side and the uh, receiving RIR. And the other way also applies. If um, somebody outside LACNIC wants to transfer toward our region, they're also going to, they'll have to follow a number of steps. We're going to receive a contact of AP NIC or uh, RIPE or uh, the, whoever telling us that somebody wants to buy them. So we get in touch with the um, uh, organization that receives it, and then they'll have to justify why they want to receive that space. So let's go a little faster. So that was about intra and inter RIR transfers. Now I'm going to talk about the list of potential transfers. This is a service that we have offered we started in uh, 2018. So as uh, upon request of our members, the intra RAR transfers were already allowed, but um, they didn't know where to go. What are the IPv4 blocks that would be available for a transfer or even an organization that uh, maybe was going to quit a certain service and wanted to, to offer that, uh, uh, to transfer it to an organization that needs it. They didn't know where to go. So we created a list publishing this. It's a list of the organizations that would be ready to offer an IPv4 block that also th they would be ready to, they received one from LACNIC and they would be ready to offer it to other organizations. So. In this list, we can also see the organizations that would be ready to receive an IPv4 block. And we can also find a list of uh, intermediary or brokers. Um, so what is the information that is published here? I left it this in blank because of security reasons. So the information that is published here is the uh, range, the uh, uh, prefix that wants to be transferred. If you're offering us the, the, then to know what prefix is available, 
then the organization that wants to transfer, then the contact name, the email, and the telephone number. In the list of organizations with the potential of receiving, it's going to say you have the same information. Such and such organization is ready to receive a slash 20 and the telephone is, is this. So there you have the information of uh, the broker and uh, the contact. Who can see this listing? It's not public. Uh, the uh, information that is published there can only be seen by the organizations that uh, have uh, that are requiring the service, either selling or requesting after an analysis. Once LACNIC uh, gives clearance, then you can see the listing. And why do I say that it's reliable? Because it's checked first. If uh, somebody who's an, an organization that's offering a slash something uh, within the region, then they let us know, filling a form, we check whether the company that is offering the addresses, whether the, they, uh, whether the uh, um, owner or the authorities know that uh, that uh, is uh, being sold and how they justify the use of the um, IPv4 blocks you given to this uh, company first. So there's a very rigorous process that they have to go through to, to ensure that the list will be reliable. And this comes with a cost and uh, for a certain duration, for a period. The cost is $200. There's a cost for publication and it won't be reimbursed if the request is not accepted and it lasts for 12 months. Because beyond uh, those 12 months, things may change. If you haven't succeeded in transferring it after 12 months, then maybe there are different needs and maybe you are not uh, ready to transfer a slash 20, but something smaller, or maybe somebody uh, asked for a, um, a transfer and maybe now you need more or less IPv4 space because you're, uh, you're all, you've already implemented IPv6, so this may change. And it's renewable, as, as I said, the publication stays there for 12 months, and if it were to be renewed, it should undergo new analysis and again pay $200. The advantage of publishing it in the list of uh, the possible transfers is that if we find an organization that is ready to receive, and I am offering an IPv4 block, the approval would be almost right away. You don't need any further analysis process because it's already been done and that's why it's uh, posted in the portal. So that would be basically the aim of this service, the list of uh, the possible transfers. Mariela, that's what I had to tell, tell you. So now we would be ready for questions. Okay. Let me start by thanking Alfredo and Sergio. Your presentations were very clear. I assume that everybody, that uh, the participants will be very happy. We have many, many questions. We're going to try to answer as many as possible. Let's start. The first one is by Ricardo Sanchez, who's asking, once the blocks are transferred, how soon are they linked to the new companies? Thank you, Ricardo, for your question. Please consider that what LACNIC does is uh, keeping an updated uh, uh, register. Uh, we don't administer the routes. When we inform the uh, stakeholders that the transfer has been completed, that uh, is uh, we register that and then it is available through the who is service you can access it through the lacnic website there you press uh, who is or lacnic query and you can copy paste uh, the ipv4 block and right away you're going to see the results that you'll know who the organization is and from then on they uh, have the oversight of that in addition we are constantly informing both the uh, the seller and the buyer that the request has been completed and it is ready to be used. 
Thank you, Sergio. Let me tell you, uh, I'm going to ask both you and Alfredo to please consider that there is a simultaneous interpreting. So please try to speak slowly so that the interpreters may work the best way possible. So let's go on. Now there's a question by Eduardo M who says, does that apply to Mexico? That is through uh, the Milaknik portal or should it be done through uh, uh, the RIR? Um, thank you, Mariela. Thank you, Eduardo, for your question. Well, actually, the same rules apply, but as you pointed out, it needs to be through the RIR portal or writing to IP master slash uh, at uh, LACNIC uh, uh, dot uh, MX. And you can find the process detailed in a website in services, resource transfers. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. We have another question by Alfonso Tapia Duarte, who says, after the transfer, who will LACNIC charge the, uh, um, the, the block uh, transferred if it's partial? Thank you for your question. Well, the organization in our region always pays. That is the prices established in this presentation that I showed would pay. If it's uh, an inter-RIR transfer, then the seller will pay for it. Now, if it was outside the region, each RIR manages its cost. APNIC, uh, AP um, in the case, in the example that I gave, then uh, they would charge it to the member in the region. When it's inside the region, within LACNIC, the payment of that transfer will be done by the buyer. That. Excellent, excellent. Julio Suarique says, good afternoon. When the transfers are made, all the information of the IP segment is updated. Is there any reference to the previous owner? That is, if a se segment is transferred from LACNIC to APNIC, is there any information there saying that that used to belong to LACNIC? Very good question. It's not made public. The information of the transfer is public, pointing out that the transfer was done from one region to another. As a matter of fact, we will publish a transfer log that will be available in the website under the tab transfers and IPv4 transfers. There you'll have, you'll be able to see the transfers and you'll see the history of how the movements were from what region to what region. Thank you. Sergio. Edwina Aguilar asks, the, existing, the brokers that exist today, are those that use this resource or policy? Well, so who would use the resource? Well, actually, the brokers are intermediary. They do the brokerage between uh, the seller and the buyer. Now, when a transfer process is started, as I said initially when I described the different steps, only the administrator can start that transfer. The block is never, uh, the, uh, uh, the logger doesn't know the transfers of, um, and uh, so the broker doesn't know the network, but but they can receive copies of uh, the mails if they want to involve, uh, the, to engage both the, the buyer and the seller want to engage the broker, but the broker won't be familiar with the technical details about each, uh, so they won't be able to answer the contacts. Of course, answering your question, yes, they have to meet the requirements, that is. Both the supply, both uh, the seller and the buyer need to meet the, pol the requirements in the policies. Mariela, I'd like to make an important clarification because of questions that we've been asked in the past, and it is that LACNIC does not accredit brokers. However, 
as requested by the users, we include a list of the brokers that requested to register in our list of uh, possible transfers. So those that have registered for the service, you're going to see the listing of brokers that are operating in the region and that are interested in working with LACNIC region. Thank you, Alfredo. Good, very good information. Thank you for sharing it. So let's go on with questions. There is one by Alfonso Tapia Duarte, who says, um, when there's merging of companies in the region, uh, does that mean that, that does it imply cost from Blacknik? Well, let me go on with a question. If the acquisition or the merging is under 232.17, that is another policy in the manual, it has no cost. Now, if this cannot be considered within the policy, this has to be done through the policy 232.18, which would be this case. But normally, if all the documentation is correct, that can approve this merger, then this has no cost involved. I have a question from Taila Guimaraes, and these are two questions, and I will try to ask the two questions together. Taila says, if the provider purchases ARIN blocks, is it possible to transfer these to LACNIC? And she goes on, and if this block comes from any other RIR, what is the procedure to be followed with LACNIC? Thank you, Taila, for your question. Well, I will answer the first question. If an organization purchases ARIN blocks, then this is because it has been established within ARIN. So they have to follow the transfer request policy through the ARIN portal. They can transfer this within the LACNIC region, but the process has to be started at ARIN. And the second question, can you repeat it? Yes, the second question has to do with this. If this block comes from any other RIR, well, I think I answered it at the same time. Yes, in fact, those who offer blocks have to start the request process at, in the RIR where they receive, from which they received this IP4 block. If in Malaysia, you're in Malaysia and you receive an APNIC block, you have to request the process at APNIC. The same for ARIN and the same for our RIPE NCC. You have to resort to your own RIRs to conduct the transfer. Then we have a question from Julian Medina who says, in ex your experience, how much can a block cost? I imagine that the person who does the transfer receives an income for transferring this block. Well, Julian, the truth is that LACNIC does not participate in that part of, with that part of information when we do it, it work through the intermediary work, we don't participate in the economic agreement between the two parties. But what I do suggest or recommend is the following. In the past, we have had we have seen some presentation presentations, one of Lee Howard at the LACNIC event in Rosario where references made to the value of the IP, IPs in the market. But to tell the truth, we have heard about very different prices. So this would not be a very um, reliable uh, fact. The next question is a question that is asked in English. If you are using the interpretation, please activate this to the other language. Regional transfer agreement available? Gracias por la pregunta. Eh, no. Thank you for the question. Well, this is not a document that has been published in the portal and has not been published in LACNIC's portal. This document is submitted once the request has been approved. Excellent, Sergio. Excellent, Sergio. Well, we have quite a number of questions still. And Jacqueline Sanchez would like to know what is the purpose of transferring IPv4 addresses? Well, thank you. 
Organizations have different needs and reasons for requesting these. I'm going to comment on one IPv4 is a limited protocol and considering the number of users worldwide and the devices that are connected, the RIRs have less and less IPv4 space available to assign. So for many years now, the community has established rules for assigning this IPv4 space that it was still available. And these rules, among other things, state that the organizations that request resources can only do so if they do so for the first time and the maximum we assign is a slash 22 or 1024 IPs. And although the majority of the organizations are aware of the importance of the deployment of IPv6 and of sustaining growth with that protocol, there are some other needs in the short and medium term that leads organizations to carry out these types of transactions. And this is supplemented by other types of organizations that for different reasons are willing to stop using these resources and then decide to offer them through this modality. I don't know if this answers the question. Thank you, Alfredo. So the participant will let us know if this has been answered. Alfonso Tapia Duarte said, does this also apply for uh, transfers? Well, I'm not so sure if I understood that question. So if the same rules apply for uh, delegations, well, I think that with delegations, I think he's referring to the fact when an ISP sub-assigns a block to a third party. And this is quite normal in any ISP. If ISP and I provide connectivity through different means, ASL, ADSL or fiber optics, and my clients are mostly corporate clients who need a uh, or any amount, then this is quite a normal way of distributing this in the network. So an ISP, the policy allows me to sub-assign a small block to a third party. I think that is what I think Alfonso is referring to with delegating. But that delegation will be linked to a contract that they have with the service provider. So ultimately, the ISP that has all the slash 22 is the one that will have the custody of that block. So that delegation that the customer has done will depend on the fact that the link with that client is still active. I don't know if this answers Alfonso's question. Otherwise, you can submit your question to expand this. I understand that is the case. Alfonso has just stated that he was asking that and he thanks you very much. So the next question is in English. So if you are using the simultaneous interpretation, please activate this at this moment. Will the offering party list be available for visitor broker to see it? Bien. Eh, bueno, gracias por la pregunta. Eh, Thank you for your question. The answer is yes. Both the offering parties and the brokers, the registered brokers, see the entire information in the lists. Yes, the answer is yes. You will see all those uh, who are offering and those who are registered in the region. Thank you, Alfredo. Eduardo M says, in RIPE, could we transfer this uh, right away? The answer is the following, both from RIPE and from ARIN and APNIC, transfers can already be carried out provided they comply with the processes and requirements. They have all, these are already possible. Ricardo Sanchez he asked a question which I think has already been answered. He says, in the case of Mexico, this does this belong to the 
LACNIC RIR? Yes, we are, Alfredo already, already answered this. This had to be done through the IAR portal, IAR.mx, and they, you will find information for this. Ricardo Sanchez says the fee, does this only apply to the offering party, also to the one who receives this? Well, I already answered that question a while ago with details also regarding whether this is inter or intra IIR. But in the case Ricardo joined us later, he can check the presentation again and see the answer I gave, which was given in great detail. Mariela, I would like to clarify something regarding the previous question on the list of transfers. Maybe this was not fully cl clarified. Those who will be able to see the list are the offering parties, are those who are going to receive this, who registered to receive a transactions, not the transactions that are in process. These will be private until these are completed. These become public once they are concluded. They will see in the list the list, names of the organizations who are willing to offer blocks and the organizations that are willing to receive blocks and those who are willing to act as brokers. That is all. That is what I wish to clarify because I wasn't sure whether I had expressed myself correctly. Thank you, Alfredo. It is important to clarify this. Now, we have many, many questions still and we also have a limited amount of time for this webinar. So I'd like to ask you as speakers, well, we will continue with the questions and you will let us know. Maybe we can, we'd like to wrap up in time and provide an email address to answer the remaining questions or otherwise we can continue answering the questions depending on your availability. Well, we still have four minutes, so we can continue with the questions. All right, let's go on for four more minutes. Wellington Beta says, after an initial transfer, is there some waiting time for a next, uh, the next transfer? Thank you, Wellington, for your question. Well, this depends on the situation of your organization. If you are an offering party and you carried out a transfer, and this was a partial transfer, then you don't need to work a given period of time for an additional transfer. However, if you receive if you received an IPv4 block from a transfer, you have to wait at least 12 months before you transfer that block again, whether partially or completely. I don't know if this answers your question, but that would be the answer. Well, the participant will let us know if this was fully answered or not. Thank you, Sergio. Jose Cantu says, are there recommendations on geolocation of IPs? For example, when you transfer a block from one region to another and the receiving organization has some kind of blocking locally because this block appears as a block originating from another country. Well, thank you, Jose, for your question. That's a great question. And in fact, inter-RIR questions have been carried out for quite a number of years. And although we have had issues with geolocation, we're not aware, well, we have a lot of experience inter-RIRs and intra-RIRs. But regarding the IPv4 transfers transferred in the region, these were issues were corrected rapidly. Now, the problem is that the majority of the companies that offer these services and IP geolocation probably have their, they have their own databases and through the WHOIS. We don't know how frequently these are updated. We know how, don't know how frequently this, this data is updated. The recommendation is then to identify the IP geolocator that is providing incorrect information and then to notify them that this is not correct and they have to do an update. These companies normally have a point of contact 
and you can issue a ticket. And as I was saying a while ago, we have the who is information available uh, option available, which is the authoritative database that provides this resource and to which country this has been offered. So you have these geolocation websites, for example, stating this block was moved from Argentina to Colombia, and this still appears to be in Argentina. And this is the evidence that shows the who is a black nick, and this is already available in Colombia. So that's a recommendation we can do in that sense regarding IP geolocation. And also, I'd like to tell you that within the milac nick portal, there is an area called GeoFit, where each associate can report in which country that block is being used. So the geolocators can take that information, the geo feeds, and we then publish it in the internet. Well, thank you, Sergio. Guillermo Sanguinetti says, can we see the list of other RIRs? Can others see LACNIC's list? Thank you for the question, Guillermo. The truth is that we should have to find out in RIR how this works. Each RIR has different rules and they offer different services. I'm not quite sure at this moment how each works. I'm not quite sure if they have a category. So, uh, well, I don't know how this, how this has evolved over time. Until not so long ago, RIPE had a list that was open to whoever wished to participate. APNIC had one for its members. But the, what I would recommend is to check this in the website of each RIR. They all offer different services, which are different from our own. And in our case, the only way a person would have to see the list is by participating either as a, a bidder or receiver or a broker. Well, thank you, Alfredo. If you will agree, we would uh, receive one more question. Julian Medina, that has to do with statistics that were mentioned in the presentation. His question is as follows. What is the transfer statistics in the region in the last year? Well, Julian, just give me a second so I can go back to the slide. Well, within the region, when you say this last year, you mean 2020? Because last year it was 63 intra RIR transfers. And this year, so far, there are about, there have been about 20. There are several underway. If you count those, this would be 30 transfers. Some processes were delayed in March and April with some restrictions, but now they're normal again. So I estimate that by uh, the end of the year, the figures will be similar to 2019, about 50 to 60 intra-RIR transactions. Inter-RIR, we don't have any numbers because uh, this service was launched, wasn't launched until a week ago. Thank you, Alfredo. Just, uh, and now we, we are a bit late, but we answer a new question and then we'll give you an uh, email address where you can ask. John Avila says, how long does it take to technique to go through to check a request uh, and to answer it, do you have, can you estimate the full time, all the time that you need uh, for the entire process, inter or intra RIR? Thank you for that uh, question. Well, actually the uh, uh, time varies a lot because it depends a lot on what uh, the scenario of the seller and the, bu and the buyer are and how frequently they uh, answer our questions and there are other issues too. Your mail may not be so close. We analyze the requests as they come in. First in, first out. So not just the transfer of resources, but we typically we answer it within 24 or 48 hours, but it all depends on 
how swiftly you answer our questions. It varies, the scenario changes a lot. The buyer, for instance, the receiver, they, they may be providing ADSL or cable or hosting services, a broad range of services. So he will have to justify how the block will be uh, used in each of those, uh, in which services that they're going to use. Now, it's different if uh, the organization only sells one uh, service, for instance, a WISP. And in that case, it's easy to explain how they're going to distribute it. So it changes a lot depending on uh, the uh, scenario. Jonathan also mentioned an important thing. What happens when it's an inter-RIR? In the slides, I said that the procedure is that as soon as what in our region we have identified that uh, the bidder uh, meets all the requirements, we inform the RIR so they may start their analysis process uh, to the organization that's offering the 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 block so it all depends on uh, the uh, speed of uh, the communications between them so i i would be unable to tell you whether it's going to be one two weeks one month two months it varies a lot it's not uh, as when you are requesting an analysis of resources a transfer request could take a little longer because they are more, more rigorous and even more if you have to share it with another rir so we we would have to wait for the first transfers to see how long it would take excellent excellent very good explanation now let me tell you that we had more than 30 questions and more than 20 were answered in this webinar there are still pending questions we in the chat we put some links that you can consult and as well as addresses where you can send your questions, postmaster transfers. But anyway, I, I wanted to ask your email addresses if they can uh, send you the questions. Yes, thank you, Mariela. Everything that has to do with transfers, please write to transferencias at lacnic.net transferencias at lacnic.net. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this excellent webinar. Let me tell you that uh, we had over 100 participants online. So it was very interesting to receive uh, your information. And Sergio, and Alfredo, I assume that you'll receive more questions by mail. We ask the participants to please send the questions. And once again, we thank you for uh, participating in uh, our cycle of webinars. Remember that if you registered, you receive an email with the link that will enable you to have access to the webinar so you can go through all the information that Sergio and Alfredo sent us. So, thank you a lot. Thank you for your time. And without further ado, good afternoon. Thank you, Mariela. And uh, thank you all for your time. Yes, have a nice afternoon. Goodbye. Bye.